When I was quite a young teenager, Easter was a disappointment for me. Only because of this, that in that little western suburbs church in the industrial area of Sydney, we had a service on Easter and that was the last we ever heard of it until the next year. <laughs> and so it's encouraging to find that in the lectionary in the Uniting Church, we are now in Easter 6, which gives me scope to talk about Easter today. And there's a bit of a rush associated with it. If you read through the four Gospels, the women came quickly away from the tomb and ran to tell the disciples. The women came out and ran away from the tomb. Peter went running from the tomb. Mary came running to the disciples. Peter and John ran together to the tomb. But if you look closely at the end of St Mark's Gospel, you will find that the women came out and ran away from the tomb because they were frightened out of their wits. I like that translation from the Jerusalem Bible. They were frightened out of their wits and they said nothing to a soul because they were afraid. You see, they could come to terms with a dead Jesus in bringing aromatic oils so that they could anoint the body of their dead master. They were exercising some means of control. They could perhaps go back to their old ways, have a reunion every year and talk about the good old days. But that's very different from a living Christ whom you can't control and has his own way of dealing with us. No wonder they were afraid. There's a lovely line in John Macefield's play, The Death of Jesus, in which Pilate's wife speaks to Longinus, the centurion on duty at the crucifixion, and says to her, and she says to him, do you think that Jesus is dead? And Longinus says, no, he's not dead. Well, where is he? He's let loose in the world where neither Roman nor Jew can stop his truth. You see, religion can become an escape, especially when it's a merely a matter of words and not deeds. It can be a means of keeping the living Lord at bay. R. W. Dale was a congregational minister in the 19th century, and one Easter Eve he was preparing his sermon and he wrote down the simple line, Jesus is alive. And he stopped. Do I believe that? As alive as I am? And from that time onwards, every Sunday in the service, they sang an Easter hymn. He needed to remind his people that Jesus was alive with them every Sunday. And once we admit we cannot control him, as the service puts it, when we seek to follow the way of Jesus, then we find that his actions in forming our lives can make a tremendous difference. Now, what did it mean for those first disciples to believe that Jesus was alive? Read the end of John's Gospel or into the book of the Acts and you'll discover that fishing and collecting taxes and making tents was much easier than taking Jesus seriously. And so these women, frightened, heartbroken, had stumbled up the rough cemetery path in the eerie light of dawn 
only to find an empty tomb and hear a voice saying, he is not here, he is risen. They'd knocked on the door of death, hoping to pay their respects to a corpse. And now they were told he's not in and he's not coming back. So where's the rush? Well, they hurried away from the tomb in awe and great joy. They'd been confronted by the greatest mystery of all and their Lord was alive. So this first of all, they turned away from dwelling in the past to living in the future. If you read the Gospels carefully, you'll see that the disciples believed that they'd buried their hopes when they buried their leader. They'd remember him, they'd remember what he'd said, they'd remember what he'd done. They could cling to the past remembering the good old days when Jesus was with them, as we do after a funeral. But it was all in the past. And then the Easter message came, he is not here, he is risen. One of my good friends went to study in the seminary in New York, Union Seminary, and he and his wife went off to an Easter service and when they got to the church door, there was a big notice on it that simply said, he is not here, he is risen. He is going before you into Galilee, there you will see him. It was a former minister of this church who told the story of a man who had a wonderful spiritual experience. So wonderful indeed that he wrote it down. And every so often when he was a bit down and when he was a bit perplexed, he would take it out and read it. And one day he was having a particularly bad day and he said to his wife, would you please go and get my spiritual experience for me so that I can read it. And she came back and said, I'm sorry to say, the mice have eaten your spiritual experience. So whenever we are tempted to look backwards instead of forwards, we need to hear the Easter message. He is not here, he is risen. He is going ahead. There you will find him. Sometimes we may be tempted to think that there was a better time than this to be a Christian, a better time than this to be a church. Well, let me tell you, this is the only time you've got. They hurried away from the religious world into the secular. Quite by accident, on Friday night, I was reading a book by Bishop Michael Curry. He spoke at the wedding of uh, Meghan and Prince Harry. And speaking at the annual convention of the Episcopal Diocese of North Carolina, he talked about the modern day Galilee. Scholars tell us that Galilee in biblical times included a diverse mix of people, ethnically, economically, religiously. Galilee was a place of social and political unrest. It was often the breeding ground for rebellion. It was a volatile environment of anxiety and fear. Jerusalem was the center of religious activity, but Galilee, was so different. And too often we've tried to restrict Jesus to an institution, a specific religious act, a special day. And Jesus, call, Jesus calls us out of Jerusalem into Galilee. Many of you will know about the Iona community. Some of you have been there. 
It's on an island in Scotland and its founder was Dr George MacLeod. Years ago when I was writing my ordination thesis, I was referred to a book that uh, George MacLeod wrote called Only One Way Left. You can put your dash where you want to. But he wrote in that words that affected me then and still affect me today. I'm arguing, he said, that Jesus is not crucified in a cathedral between two candles, but on a cross between two thieves. On the town garbage heap, at a crossroad so cosmopolitan that they had to write his title in Hebrew and Latin and Greek, at the kind of place where cynics talk smut and thieves curse and soldiers gamble because that is where he died and that is what he died about and that is where we ought to be and what we should be about. Some years ago in the church that I was at in Sydney, we invited Justice Ray Watson, not the man at the back of the church here, but the family court judge. And he spoke about his work and his Christian belief. And he said, what I want from my church is a church with a good liturgy, preferably finishing with the Lord's Supper. And then I want them to say to me, now get the hell out of here. Because the world in which I live is hell for so many people. I wonder what would happen if Peter and Wall and I one day, instead of the benediction, said to you, now get to hell out of here. And so we think of the Galilee that we are forced, called upon to face. I remember a young rabble-rousing minister who looked a little bit like me, berating his congregation and telling them, your mission is to go out into the world and take Christ with you. And then I read only one way left. And I changed my sermon because now it became our task is to go out into the world and meet with Jesus where he is. And so as we go out into the world, we may not recognise him. We may not recognise where we will find Jesus. I'd be disappointed with myself and I think some of you will be disappointed if I didn't mention Matthew 25. Whatever you did for one of my brothers, one of my sisters here, you did for me. So where is Jesus? In Africa, where a child with a distended belly dies of starvation. In India, where a beggar searches through the garbage for something to eat. In Australia, where a single mother seeks to provide for her family, where the elderly person shivers lonely in a drafty apartment, where the homeless filled with despair and see no future and take away their frustration on society or their families or themselves. In the anguish of refugees and asylum seekers, Jesus is there. In the agony of the lost generation, Jesus is there. In the tensions of the Middle East, in the suffering of innocent people in the Ukraine, Jesus is there. Where people are discriminated against because of their colour, their ethnic background, their sexuality, their political and religious beliefs, Jesus is there. 
That's where you'll find Jesus this week. He's looking for us to join him in our modern Galilee. Amen.